Awesome. Well, everyone, my name is Sue Brobsky, and I am a registered nurse with the West Ada School District. Um, I work at a couple schools, Meridian Elementary School, Crossroads Middle School, which is an alternative middle school. And then I'm the liaison between the West Ada School District and the Meridian Schools Clinic, which is part of FMRI, and it is a pediatric clinic located here on the campus at Meridian Elementary School. So um, Carly is going to be my slide clicker. So go ahead, Car Carly, and click to the next one, which will disclose to you. Um, I basically am a full-time employee of the West Data School District. So next slide, we'll look over our learning objectives for the day. So today we're going to really um, review a lot of very big topics, very kind of superficially, because any one of these topics we could probably teach a three credit hour graduate course on. So the first uh, things we're gonna look at is what is MTSS in the schools, the multi-tiered system of support, and what is PBIS, positive behavioral interventions. Then we're gonna touch on IDEA, in section 504 and look at how IEPs and 504 programs provide behavior supports in schools and then look at how you would actually qualify for that and then look at it says parentships but we will be looking at partnerships between primary care and the school setting um, with students with behavior needs. Next slide please. So when we talk about multi-tiered systems of support, here we have a picture and this is, would be our whole student body. So you can see a tier one student is a student that is basically your gen ed student that is able to gain access to successful learning through the gen ed curriculum. And really that's 75 to 85% of our kids. Um, then we have tier two kids. These are kids that for some reason, it's, they're not being successful in progressing in their academics at tier one. So we give them some um, supports. It may be small group settings. It may be um, some one-on-one -on -one with adult time. It may be some social supports. Um, and then we have our, and that's you know 10 to 20% of our kids. Then we have our targeted and intensive kids. And this is like three to 5% of our kids that really need um, specialized instruction. And there's a process that you have to go through by law to get to that point, which we're gonna talk about today. But before we do the next slide, please, we'll talk about the other positive behavior intervention system, which is, uh, basically PBIS, and I love this quote because in the schools, if a kid doesn't know how to read, we teach them. If they don't know how to swim, we teach them. Or if they don't know how to multiply, we teach them. And we teach them how to drive. But when it comes to behaviors, sometimes we teach them, but sometimes we punish them. And, and I think we all can think of examples over the years, um, maybe from our own time in school or from students that you've spoken to that fall into both of those categories. And so um, with a positive behavior intervention system, what that looks like is you really target what we want to see in kids from behaviors. So here in elementary school, we want, if we are talking say about playground behaviors, we need kids to be safe. So on the slide, you know, you come down feet first, you don't climb up the slide. So we really break down behaviors from how to behave in classrooms, how to behave in hallways, how to behave in the cafeteria. And we teach those and we teach them over and over and over again. Um, and so each school will determine what their goals are. And, and along with teach them every day, we have posters about it. We have, um, well, we, we used to have assemblies, but assemblies have been on hold for a bit, but we just hit it over and over and over again. Um, next slide, please. So I just threw this in really quick because as we move into special ed, I really want people to understand that probably from 1900 into the 50s, those tier two and tier three kids 
just kind of got lost in the system. And you can see there has been a flurry of educational supports for those two tier and tier two and tier three kids um, over the last um, you know, 50 or 60 years. Next slide, please. So when we look at supporting kids uh, with behavior needs in the schools, we have 504s and IEPs. Um, and so oftentimes people ask me, like, I don't really get the difference. What's the difference between a 504 and IEP? And basically they both follow under different kinds of laws. So first we're gonna talk about an IEP or an individualized education plan. And this falls under IDEA or the Individuals with Disability Act. And basically we'll talk about the three pronged approach that meets the eligibility requirements. But basically you have to have a disability that requires specialized instruction for you to access your education. And so if you meet the eligibility requirements, you can get special education services, accommodations, modifications, and you can have that from the time you're three in developmental preschool all the way through 12th grade. Um, to, to qualify for that, we have a team of individuals that meet and you can read through that list there. Um, and we meet um, multiple meetings oftentimes to qualify a student and then develop their specialized education services. And then we meet on a yearly basis and we reevaluate it formally every three years. So switching over to section 504, you can see it falls under a different law. This falls under the Rehab Act of 1973. So before 1973, if you were someone with a disability that was impacting your major life function, you didn't really have a lot of support. Um, and so the difference with a 504 is it basically levels the playing field for kids to get access to their education. So for example, if you have ADHD and you absolutely cannot sit still in that chair and you wanna stand up in the back of the room to learn, if you have a 504 that gives you that as an accommodation, we're not changing your education, you're still getting the same gen ed education we're just giving you an accommodation that you can stand up instead of have to sit down the whole time. That's just a, a very kind of broad overview of an example. Um, a 504 can follow you into college. There's no age limit. And who's on the team is different. We don't need our school psychologists. We don't need a bunch of testing. We need a parent or a guardian. And then staff who are familiar with the student as far as evaluation data, like their, their testing at school, their grades, and then basically someone that can authorize implementing a plan. Um, once again, we review it annually, we reevaluate every three years, but if a student has a change in their um, disability or functioning, we can meet at any time and, and just change that. Next slide, please. So back to that um, IEP, There's, it's called the three-pronged test. And that is how you can qualify under IDEA for an IEP. So basically, you need to have a disability. And this is an important piece here. That disability has to cause an adverse educational impact. So if your student was schizophrenia, for example, that's a, one of the qualifying disabilities. But let's say you're doing awesome, you're doing awesome on your meds, you're doing awesome on your grades, you're doing awesome in your life, you don't have an adverse educational impact. So although you have, may have a disability, um, if it's not causing an adverse educational impact, we wouldn't look at changing uh, your curriculum. And then um, the third prong is obviously they need the specially designed instruction. So go ahead, next slide. So this is what will not get you a 504 IEP. I get orders on prescription pads, needs an IEP for 504. And while the diagnosis is very helpful and very important and feedback from providers is invaluable, 
you can see that this piece of paper alone will not make it happen. Um, we have to follow the process because once again, these are laws. So it, the process is there's a referral made and it can come from the parent, the teacher, the doctor, the referral can come from many places. Then we have to determine eligibility through the process we just discussed. We develop the plan and then we develop our monitoring system. Um, but the, the prescription alone does not make this happen. Um, next slide. So I wanted to include this because on the right side, the diagnosis side, this is what you're seeing in the office. Kids could have behavior issues because of cancer, autism, Tourette's, ADHD, depression, all kinds of things. But that is not the IDEA or the individual with disability categories. We then take that diagnosis and have to flip it into one of these categories that would qualify them for service. And so I won't read through them, you can see them. We're gonna touch a little bit more in depth on the emotional disturbance category. But I want you, when we talk about this, to imagine your parents sitting in a chair at school. You come into a team that could be an admin, speech and language, a nurse, a psychologist, a special ed teacher, a gen ed teacher. I mean, there's a big team of people in the conference room and you're sitting down because you know your child needs help and they then are using the category of emotional disturbance. That, though, I wish it was named something else because that is a really heavy um, kind of, label to put on a student. And so when I talk with parents, I try to explain to them, and, and really when we go to the next slide, please, you'll see that I, I try to get them to look beyond those two words and really look at what does that mean? And it means that you have a student that is struggling and they've been struggling oftentimes for a long period of time to such a degree that it's affecting their educational performance. And so the student has to meet one of these criteria that we either can't explain why they can't learn. You know, we've tested their intellect, they've got everything they need, their senses are good, we've checked their hearing, we've checked their vision, they don't have any other diagnoses or they can't make friends with peers and teachers. Um, they have inappropriate types of behavior. Um, you, can, you can read through these. A general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression. Once again, for a long period of time, six months or longer at least, um, if they develop physical symptoms or fears associated with people in the school or school problems, and then um, schizophrenia. So next slide. So I wanted to bring this case to your attention because this young student, Andrew F., he was an autistic student in Colorado and he, between fourth and fifth grade, parents said, look, he's not making progress. We need to sit down and go over his IEP. And the school met, they didn't make any changes, although the student was not making progress. And so the parents uh, were frustrated. And so the parents decided to pull him out of public school and put him into a private school. And so as we, before we click to the next slide, I wanna point out that this case, the importance of this case is it shows not only do we need to um, offer the services, but we really need to be sure that the services are enabling our students to make progress. So move to the next slide. And we'll keep talking about Andrew here a little bit more. So Andrew um, was moved to a private school to help him with his autism. And he was, you know, headbanging, flipping desks, Dr. Streeter, you know, when I send you those pictures like, help Dr. Streeter, I don't know what to do. Look at what happened in class today. Those kinds of situations. Um, 
when he got into the private school that worked with autistic kids, they put him on a behavior intervention plan, which he responded quite well to and began to make academic progress. So parents uh, went to the school district and said, look, we want you to pay, I think it was $40,000 for his tuition. And of course, the school district said no. And it worked all the way up to the Supreme Court, where the school district ultimately did end up paying the private school tuition. And the standards were changed. It used to be the standards were as long as a school did not violate procedures, meaning that parents were invited to the meeting, they got a copy of everything. And the IEP was reasonably calculated that the student would benefit, that was good enough. But in 2017, after this case, the Supreme Court said, when you talk about benefits, we're not looking at minimal benefits. We need benefits will allow students to make progress or the team is working with the parent and the student to keep tweaking the plan to figure out a way to make progress. So I guess the reason I'm pointing this out to all the providers out there is if you're talking to a parent and they are saying, look, you know, I meet with the schools, the plans never change. And you say, have you ever heard of the behavior intervention plan? And they scratch their head and say, no, we don't have anything like that. Um, schools, we, we are really held accountable to work with parents and kids to be sure that they are making progress. Now, does that mean their progress will have them at grade level? No, not always. Um, it's the goal. But I, I did want that um, to kind of be in the forefront of everyone's mind. Go ahead, next slide. Um, I think, okay, down at the bottom here, for those of you out there that are working in education, um, if we have students that are exhibiting challenging behaviors, always consider how that's having the adverse impact on students' education, because that's what we're about, right? We're about education and access to education. Always include the parent because no matter how well we think we know a student, and for some of these kids, we work with them. You know, if I have a kid that comes up in as a developmental three year old and they end up at crossroads, I could have this student for eight to 10 years, but no matter how long I have this student, the parent always knows the student best. And then always be willing to develop, implement, monitor, take data you know, to really be able to show that we are trying to help our students make progress. Okay, next slide. So for you, the providers out there, I wanna point out what you see is what I see. What you see is what we see in the schools. So I did a presentation, this was probably from 2016, 2017 data. Um, we had a little bit less than 38,000 kids in West Ada at the time. Um, in our electronic medical record, there was 138 different kinds of medications. Um, many of them would have a behavioral component to them. And at the time, we had given, this was over, I think it was an eight-month period, given over 26,000 doses of meds in schools. So I wanted you to be aware of um, when you're working with kids in the office and, and they're having struggles, assume what you see is what we see. Um, and I just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention, the amount of medications we really are using in the school environment. Next slide. So when we look at partnering between primary care in schools. Um, issues for schools is we have things we're required to do, required by law, required because of all the, the things that school laws require. Um, but once again, we always have to look at what's required for an appropriate education and helping kids access their education. So I always kind of think about speech when I when I write this. So if I have a, a student that is got speech and language disability and they're having behaviors because they're frustrated, 
because kids can't understand them at school. So we are required to help the student with their speech and language access their education. But oftentimes they may also need outside speech and language services because once again, the school services are requiring um, what they need to access their education. So um, oftentimes they're needing both in-school supports and out-of-school supports. Um, when I have kids that are coming back to me with health issues, I can have multiple providers sending me information. I can have information from the counselor, from the psychiatrist, from the family practice doc. So it always is helpful to us to kind of know who the captain of the ship is um, for students that are coming in with behavior issues. Um, because sometimes we do get conflicting orders um, between providers. Of course, HIPAA and then FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is kind of like the educational HIPAA. Um, so when I have students with behavior issues or medical issues and parents come in to talk to me, I always encourage them to fill out a release of information because I say to them, you know, it's oftentimes really helpful for your doctor or your healthcare provider to understand what your student's school day is like. And sometimes um, parents' perception of their kid's school day is accurate. And sometimes it's not exactly the way their days are going. So um, with that, I, for example, I keep coming back to you, Dr. Streeter, because you're one that I write letters to from time to time, like, hey, Dr. Streeter, these are all the things that I've tried. Um, we're having a hard time. Help putting my white flag up kind of letters. Um, and, and I thank you, Dr. Struder, for all the help you've given me over the years. But it's nice to be able to reach out to the nurse in the doctor's office or the doctor and just be like, hey, these are the struggles we're seeing at school. Um, then uh, sometimes it's difficult to get access to providers just to talk with them. Obviously, lack of resources in the schools. Um, as we move into this next school year, I know even in West Ada, we don't have all of our nursing positions filled, last I heard. And um, here in the Treasure Valley, we have a, a large wealth of medical resources in the schools as compared to our rural uh, communities. And then attendance, attendance, attendance. I just can't tell you um, if you can take away from today that attendance matters and having kids in structure. This is what you do every day. This is your job um, for, for kids, even if they're um, struggling with behaviors, if we can get them to school, then the expectation is you come each day no matter what. I don't care if you come in your pajamas you know, we can get you dressed once you get here because what we see is oftentimes, and, and I see this every year, significant behaviors at home, parents just can't deal with it anymore. So the student ends up staying at home. And then we get into um, positive reinforcement for negative behaviors. It's the same with out of school suspension. If a kid has, um, behaviors that are not conducive to the educational environment and we put them on out of school suspension, then basically in many cases, we are giving positive reinforcement to the negative behavior and the kid knows, hey, if I go in and flip a desk and you know, throw a few cuss words, if I can get sent home, um, we, we want to keep our kids in school as much as possible. Next slide, please. Um, once again, just to really drive this chronic absence home, these are examples of notes that I get from doctor's offices. So you can see the one on the left. Basically, there's a ton of dates the student was out. And when I called this provider and I said, boy, do, do you realize the number of excused absences you're giving this student? The provider had zero idea that they had excused that many days. Um, and so ideally, 
you know, if a student's going to be out, we take it one day at a time. We don't give them an excuse for a whole big swath of time. So I, I just wanted to once again drive home. If kids are chronically absent, they will have poor educational outcomes. If we can get them here, we can teach them. So next slide. Um, as far as from a provider point of view, I can see the frustrations being, you can see inconsistent policies between the different school districts. Um, you know, as we move into these next couple of weeks, we're gonna have Boise with uh, masking, we're gonna have less data with recommended masking. So we, we get different policies between school districts. Um, we oftentimes have kids with complex behavioral or medical issues that we're trying to manage in non-clinical settings. So sometimes what you'd really like us to do, we can't do because we either don't have uh, enough medical staff available or we don't have the ability to, to do a certain treatment. Um, the other thing is sometimes I think as healthcare providers, you may not be getting the full information about what's going on in school. And so you may not be getting their progress reports. Um, so, you know, once again, those HIPAA restraints, you can't always pick up the phone and call and be like, hey, Nurse Sue, how's so-and-so doing at school? But if you get that release and send it to me, you know, I can help you, I can get you Vanderbilts. And um, if you're working in a school system where there maybe is no nurse, there's a principal there that should be able to help you gather the information you need about how kids are doing in schools. Um, so next slide, please. So in summary, if we look at effective partnerships to support behavioral health in our students or your patients, um, I hope that today gave you an understanding of the difference between a 504 and IEP and the process that we're bound by law to go through. And then realize not all schools are created equal, that um, schools in the Treasure Valley are gonna have more resources than our schools. I have maybe one nurse for the whole county. Um, but I want you to use school resources for information from absences to are my kids getting their meds every day? How are the meds working? How are they doing in school? Um, you know, keep in mind, at least here for my students, a lot of my students get dropped off at seven in the morning at the Boys and Girls Club. They have breakfast there, they come to school all day, they go back to the Boys and Girls Club and some of them are there till seven at night. So um, we can give you a lot of information about um, behavioral issues and, and what's going on with kids in school through ongoing communication, coordination, sharing our knowledge and expertise. And that is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Sue. That was so great. Um, sorry, I think I interrupted you, Dr. Robinson. You have a oh. question or reflection? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say thank you, Sue, so much. That was really, really helpful. I was wondering if maybe you could chat a little bit more about the metrics or what outcomes need to be measured um, in order for individuals to, to kind of make sure that they're progressing. So, so kind of maybe a little bit more about where people need to kind of be prepared to have those metrics. So that's a great question, Renee. And um, when you're looking at an IEP, the tricky thing is it is an individualized education plan, right? So some kids may be needing academic, math, reading, written language. Other kids may need that along with social or behavioral supports. And so um, for a kid with behavior issues, typically what we do is we develop a behavior intervention plan. And then that behavior in intervention plan, it will be like, you know, 80% of the time the student will, whatever the desired behavior, I, I'm just making that up. And then the teacher or um, whoever is in the classroom, sometimes it's a para, well, they will keep basically data. Sometimes it's just little tick marks. Um, it, it depends once again on the student's specifics. So
So it may be three out of five times on the first request, the student will comply with what's requested in the classroom environment. Um, it, it really is individualized. But when we develop those plans, we develop them you know, with the gen ed teacher, with the special ed teacher, with the parent, always looking at the desired behavior and trying to use positive interventions um, because positive interventions, I mean, it works best with everyone, right? So we always try to take a positive approach. So that's a very broad answer. Um, I, and I hope that, that that helps Renee. No, that was really helpful because it sounds like it's really kind of a rubric that you just that you establish for each individual child, like mm -hmm. kind of where they need to be and kind of what progress looks like. So that sounds perfect. Thank you. Angela, you have your hand up. Did you have a question or a reflection? Just a comment. Um, so just for those who don't know, as the Parent Training and Information Center for Idaho, our work is uh, funded and supported under the US Department of Ed Office of Special Education Programs. So everything we do at Idaho Parents Unlimited or IPOL as people know us is around helping families understand those the eligibility process, the assessment process, how to how to understand their child's IEP and um, and how to measure progress, et cetera. So we actually do trainings, workshops on all of this and definitely one to one assistance. We get called, you know, please feel free to refer families to our office if you think that they are needing assistance in understanding their eligibility process or how to go about a referral or making that referral themselves. You know, how do I request uh, an assessment for special education or a 504 plan? That is that is everything we do and always at no cost to parents. And certainly any any of our professional partners that want clarification on that too we're 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 at no cost to you all as well so um just a little plug for for what we do and, and angela you, that's Sue. really important because so often parents are in these meetings and they are overwhelmed it is overwhelming when you have a big medical team come in and your student is struggling which is why you're there um, and so if you're the person on the school team, please always be watching that parent for that glazed over eye look that's like, I don't know what these people are talking about. And be the person to reach out to the parent and reassure them like, it's gonna be okay, we're all here on the same team. Because parents, uh, everyone is really doing their best, but some parents, it, it is tough. And especially if they're a parent with a disability. Some of my parents can't read. Some of my parents can't write. Some of my parents' English is not their primary language and I need an interpreter in there. Like always be watching the parents or the guardians to be sure that they understand. Dr. Streeter, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Uh, Sue, that was great. Thank you very much. That was super helpful and informative. I, uh, I I had a quick question. Uh, do you, as maybe it's a two prong question, but do you must you uh, have an IEP or 504 plan to have some sort of intervention, like a behavior intervention plan, or even to request something like a functional behavioral analysis, which would get a little more granularity on what exactly is contributing to the problem behaviors that we're seeing? You know, Dr. Streeter, usually we would run that through our school psych. And sometimes that is the data that then leads to the next step of the 504 IEP, because we by law have to educate students in the least restrictive environment. So if we can take data and figure out what's going on with the kid and, and you know, fix it once again, always least restrictive environment, um, our school psychs would be able to help with that. <laughs> 